Welcome to this Baptist News Global webinar. Here's your host, Mark Wingfield. Welcome, I'm Mark Wingfield, Executive Director and Publisher of Baptist News Global, and it is our pleasure to be a co-sponsor of this webinar today. Uh, this is going to be the kind of event where we're going to have just a conversation uh, among our panelists, and uh, Mitch Randall and I are going to co-moderate this today. This is also being live streamed on Baptist News Global's uh, Facebook page, that's uh, Baptist News Global on Facebook. It will be shared afterward through Good Faith Media, uh, Baptist News Global, I'm sure the other sponsors as well, I won't speak for them, uh, but we'll have it on YouTube this by this evening uh, as well. So you can access it in many ways after this. Uh, the, if you want to make a comment or ask a question during the conversation, please use the Q&A function that's at the bottom of your screen that you can access and type in your question and we'll be uh, monitoring that and then addressing those as we have opportunity uh, to work them in. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce to you now, Mitch Randall, who's my friend and colleague. Uh, we are both fellow Okies. Uh, it's just that I got out and he went back. Uh, <laughs> and <laughs> uh, Mitch is the executive director of um, Good Faith Media. Uh, and uh, he can explain that to you, but he's going to introduce our panelists and get us going. Thanks, Mark. It is a honor and delight to be here with you representing Good Faith Media. Uh, we have been uh, covering this uh, issue of conversion therapy for some time now. We just recently released uh, six videos on the topic, five personal narrative stories that are gripping and compelling also heartbreaking, but as well inspirational uh, as the survivors of conversion therapy told their story. And then the final video that we've released on this topic has to do with uh, pastoral care and policy and uh, really uh, educates uh, people on the harm that conversion therapy has on individuals as well as what is going on across the country uh, in pastoral care and policy. So it's great to be here with you and I'm delighted to be part of this webinar. Let me get right to it and introduce our esteemed panelists for today. Our first panelist is Darren, Cal or, yeah, Darren Calhoun. Darren is a justice advocate, worship leader, and photographer based out of Chicago. He works to bridge connections between people of differing perspectives through story and relationship. Currently, Darren leads worship at Urban Village Church and serves in multiple capacities with organizations like Evangelicals for Social Action, the Center for Inclusivity, and the Reformation Project. Darren, welcome to the webinar today. Hey, everyone. Glad to be here. Our next panelist is Amber Cantorna. Amber grew up in focus on the family culture where her father was an executive there at that organization. She is the author of an excellent book, Refocusing My Family and of Unashamed, a Coming Out Guide for LGBTQ Christians. She is an author and speaker and host of the Unchained Love Collective. Amber, welcome to the webinar. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And our final panelist uh, really needs no introduction because she is an incredible uh, source of information. Casey Pick. Casey is a senior fellow for advocacy and government affairs with the Trevor Project. Casey helps lead their work advancing policies and positions that support LGBTQ youth in crisis by executing the Trevor Project's advocacy agenda on the federal, state, and local level and in the executive, legislative, and judicial branch in our nation's capital. Casey, welcome to our webinar. Hey, thank you so much for having me, and uh, thanks for the uh, kind words. You bet. Well, I'm going to pitch it over to Mark here in just a second, but before I do, what I would just like to begin with is asking the simple question. And Casey, I want to begin with you. Uh, could you define conversion therapy for our audience? Sure. It's actually a great question because it's something that is sometimes intentionally obfuscated and confused. But really what conversion therapy is, is any effort through counseling, treatments, or other practices to change somebody's sexual orientation or gender identity, i.e. to take somebody who is gay and try and make them straight, to take somebody who is transgender or non-binary and try to make them cisgender. So this is not so much about what it is called. It has had many names over the years, uh, reparative therapy, ex-gay ministries, gender critical therapies, many names over the years, but it's much more about what it does. 
And so it is any effort to change somebody's fundamental nature in terms of their orientation or gender identity. Well, wow, that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and so for, the per for our purposes today, we're probably going to use the shorthand conversion therapy. But please know that when we use that term, uh, as Mitch and Casey have just explained, we're just using it as a handy guide. And it may mean a variety of things. And that plays right into our first question for each of you. Uh, and that is to ask you to tell us a bit of your own experience with some form of conversion therapy, how is this a personal story to you? Uh, Amber, maybe you wanna begin. Sure, so yeah, I'd love to jump in on that because I would take it even a step further and say that conversion therapy is not only a practice, but it's a system of belief. It's something that permeates our churches and our pulpits and our family dinner tables that who you are as a gay person is intrinsically wrong that something has to be fixed or cured or healed. I never personally enrolled in an Exodus program. However, my story in my family is a perfect example of the harms of conversion therapy. Because when I came out as gay at the age of 27, my family completely disowned me because they truly believed that being gay was a sin in the eyes of God. And that to even associate with me at that point would then put their souls in jeopardy of hell as well as mine. And so this really is a system of belief that really permeated our family growing up in many ways that maybe were even more subtle than conversion therapy, but just as harmful. Well said. Any of the rest of you have experiences uh, with conversion therapy or know someone close to you? Obviously you all work uh, in this field. I'll go quickly because I know mine is brief and then we can really go over to Darren whose story is tremendously powerful. Um, I, like any good lesbian, um, attempted to DIY it in terms of changing my own orientation when I started to figure out as a teenager that um, I was drawn to girls instead of boys. So I was never subjected to an actual practice, whether through a minister or a licensed professional, but in large part that was because I was, in order to be sent to conversion therapy, you first have to tell somebody you're feeling this way. Mm. So uh, my coming out story kind of parallels the dawn of the publicly available internet. So in the early days of America Online, I remember going to the internet and asking, what does it mean to be a girl who is attracted to girls? And the answer I got back very quickly was that you were a sinner and that God hated you. And that scared me. Um, I wanted to just be able to control this. I wanted to be accepted like anybody else. And I also found through those early chat boards and message boards that there were people who were offering up ideas on how the things that could change you, ways that you could change yourself. And so I have a very strong early memory of being about 13, 14 years old and wearing a rubber band around my wrist. Uh, that I would snap any time I thought about a girl being very pretty or that, you know, maybe I wanted to hold her hand. It didn't do a thing about my sexual orientation, but it did hurt. And it also contributed to an ongoing distrust of therapists because it was people who were claiming to be therapists and have authority and have expertise that were saying this could do something. Um, I also remember reading their ideas about what could cause sexual orientation and the idea of, you know, a woman, who, a mother who was not traditionally feminine or somebody who wasn't as present in your life as a parent. My parents had just divorced. So I started to like blame my own parents and be afraid of my love for sports or debate club as things that were making me the wrong kind of girl. So in some ways, Conversion therapy culture very strongly affected me as a uh, young teenager, and it has taken decades to get past that, even without my ever being directly subjected to something that, by my own definition that I provided, qualifies as conversion therapy. Thanks, Darren. Yeah, um, just to, to continue to expand the, the scope of this conversation, um, I... I kind of look at my story in two parts. The first part is just what happens in general culture, where as a young man, 
growing up and at, at, at around puberty, <clears throat> not feeling not feeling what the, my peers were feeling when it came to the guys being attracted to girls and so forth. Um, and just feeling like, well, something just must be wrong with me and, and showing up to the youth group and praying for healing or, you know, writing something on a piece of paper and <clears throat> putting it in the fire, those kind of experiences. It was always about my sexuality. Um, <clears throat> but at that point, I still had the idea that God loved me, that, um, that God was still in, in love with me. Um, but it wasn't until I got to college where I had this experience where I met, met somebody who was a Christian and they challenged me and said, does God want that for your life? Does God want you to be gay? Because at that point I had come out in my freshman year of college. But um, when that happened, it got me involved in a church that was charismatic and Pentecostal. And it was a 99% African-American church. And I ended up spending about the next year, eight years of my life trying not to be gay anymore under this idea that to go to heaven, I had to no longer be gay. Um, I'd received instructions from my pastor that even though I had this uh, charismatic experience where I stopped identifying as gay, he told me to never tell that story again, that I should be ashamed it ever happened. Um, and that was kind of the beginning of more and more restrictive practices until the point that I had moved away from my friends and family. I quit school, gave up my photography business. Um, I was willing to give everything for what my church leaders, who I trusted, were telling me as a young man just starting out in the world that this is what I need to do to go to heaven. Um, and while the intent is good, and I try to share this with a lot of people. My pastor didn't know what he was talking about. He didn't have a book or he didn't know about Exodus or, or different ministries that existed. He was just doing what was, again, from the culture. And so um, I love that uh, Casey pointed out that this isn't always named the same thing because nobody in my church would have named this was a, an act of conversion therapy, but there was still the same ethos that I needed to become heterosexual and that there was something that I needed to do to make that happen. Um, so I, I spent years uh, seeking that, trying that, um, go, coming to the point of almost wanting to end my life, um, all because I thought this is what God wanted. Like I had to become heterosexual to be beloved. Um, and it wasn't until all of that was just falling apart where nothing was changing, things weren't working. I changed my behavior, um, but I couldn't actually make a, a, I couldn't change my desire. And so many people think that if you just change your desire, that you're not going to be gay anymore. Or if you just change your act, actions, that you're not gay anymore, but your desires still stay the same. And so the last piece that I would add to this is even after leaving that church, I spent another eight years in a church that um, didn't, didn't want me to become heterosexual, but also didn't have policy to protect me as an LGBTQ person. So mm -hmm. I was still navigating all these hidden traps and, and snares, if you will, when it came to how do I live my life as somebody who loves God and who is also same-sex attracted or gay? Um, so yeah, we've got a lot to unpack in there, but, um, but it's, it matters. It's important. Darren, thank you so much for sharing that powerful, powerful story. And thank you for bringing to light the variety and types of conversion therapy that exist in our world. Recently, the UCLA School of Law uh, published a report citing that almost, according to their research, uh, 700,000 individuals uh, have gone through conversion therapy. In that report, they even admit that they think that number is low because there are so many stories just like yours uh, that probably are not accounted for uh, on this individual basis with a pastor or with a, you know, leadership within the church. So my next question to the panel, uh, there are a variety uh, of these types of conversion therapy. We already know that they go by different names, but what, how would you describe, what are some of the most common themes that you see in conversion therapy in their attempt to change a person's very nature? I'd jump in and say that the, the, the core of this is this promise that there's something that you can do to change your gender, to change your sexual orientation. 
Um, and with that, with that promise is that if you do enough of these things, whether that's therapy, prayer, reading scripture, fasting, um, separating yourself from friends, family, whatever it is that if you do it enough, that there is going to be some kind of change that happens. The new version of this is, well, if you just believe God, that God will do this as a response to your faith. That way they're, they're trying to mitigate this promise portion of it, but it's still the same thing that you can expect that your sexual orientation or gender identity will become cisgender or heterosexual. Yeah, uh, one of the things about having this conversation and calling out what conversion therapy can look like is that it seems like no matter how long I spend in that portion of the conversation, at the end of the conversation, somebody always comes up to me and says, you missed describing what happened to me. So that is one of the important things to know, uh, particularly because of the very illegitimacy of this. Uh, from the therapeutic side, there is no like best practices for how to engage in sexual orientation or gender identity change efforts. It is not taught anywhere. This all speaks to just how illegitimate this is, but it also contributes to the variety of forms we see out there as oftentimes these practitioners are just making it up. There are networks that pass around their you know, favorite tic, uh, tips and tricks and theories but there are so many different variations. Uh, that said, I, what a lot of what I see are things that are directed towards treating your attraction or identity as an addiction, as a response to trauma. Uh, often there will be a deep effort to try and identify a quote, root cause. Uh, was it because your father was absent, your mother was overbearing, you experienced sexual assault? They will keep digging for some kind of cause. And if you can't come up with one, they'll tell you you've repressed the memory of it. Uh, you will see twists and mistreatments of legitimate therapy practices, uh, EMDR, cognitive behavioral therapies, or just support groups like a 12-step uh, group. You will see things that are legitimate practices but put to illegitimate aims that cannot work. And oftentimes it is even just the, the feeling of failure that you didn't work hard enough or this didn't happen for you. That in and of itself contributes to tr tremendous mental health harm. Plus the practices themselves, which um, particularly as you move to the fringes can be very harmful by themselves, whether that is verbal shaming or physical pain. And Casey, just to reiterate, because that is an excellent point. Uh, the practices that you are describing, especially the attempt to connect past trauma uh, with same sex attraction. Uh, all of this is being conducted by non-licensed, non-trained therapists. Uh, and so it is, it's extremely dangerous from the research that we have uncovered uh, at Good Faith Media that uh, these people are engaged in a practice they have no business uh, messing around in. So uh, thank you for bringing that to light. I would just correct you slightly that some of this is still being done by licensed professionals and we're working hard to make that illegal. But yes, much of this is being therapy being done by people who have no business calling themselves therapists or counselors. Yeah, excellent. So Amber, Thank as, you. As, you, as you jump in on this, I, I Casey sort of loaded up the ne next area of conversation that just merges right from this. And that is how, how would you all describe what is the harm that results from this? Uh, I think we have a good understanding now of some of the things that are going on. But what is it that's really harmful about it? And how does that affect short-term, long-term? And I know, Amber, this is a big part of your story. Yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. I would say that the mental health effects of conversion therapy are great. I mean, I think all of us have some degree of um, trying to unpack the years of shame that we dealt with because of who we are and something that we tried to change but couldn't. Um, for many of us, that resulted in self-harm. I dealt with self-harm for many years because I felt like who I was was not good enough. And I think even purity culture plays a big part in that because it's taught us that you this being married 
to a opposite sex partner and having children is the only acceptable way to have a family. And so when I, and that you have to save your virginity until your wedding night and these things. And so when I lost my virginity to a woman, not only did I feel like I had broken the purity culture, but I had also broken it with a woman. And so it had like this double weight to it for me that I felt like I am now worth absolutely nothing. Like I am no better than trash. God is never gonna use me again. There is nothing left for me. And I came to the brink of suicide because of it, um, because of these theologies that taught me that my worth was wrapped up in my sexuality from multiple standpoints. And so I think the mental health um, effects are great and they are long lasting. I mean, I would say probably for all of us, I would guess that even though we've been out for many years, there's still some degree that we're unpacking of these harmful ideas and theologies that um, were wired into us because really at the core conversion therapy is like this wiring to hate yourself, to hate who you are. And so you turn that inward, um, whether that's depression or anxiety or um, self-harm or suicidal ideations, you're hardwired to hate who you are at the core. And undoing that takes years and years of work to, to love yourself, to accept yourself, to be free. And so that's why we're losing so many lives along the way and why conversion therapy is so harmful um, because it is taking lives because of the depth of harm that people are um, feeling that at their core, who they are is not okay. Something is intrinsically wrong with them um, to the point that the ostracization that I think we often feel, because that's something I would say in my family, that um, even though I didn't go to a conversion therapy program with a therapist or a group support or therapy, my family was mm. of the opinion that, well, if she doesn't change, then you ostracize her and you push her out to make her feel uncomfortable. And eventually when she feels lonely enough and ostracized enough from her community and her family, she's going to change her ways and come back to the fold and come back to, my mom would say, we're just waiting for you to come back to Jesus and come back to us. And the door will always be open when you do that. Um, but in the meantime, they kept pushing me further and further away to make me feel that ostracization um, and try and kind of passive aggressively get me to change who I was. You know, just before Darren and uh, Casey may answer this question, one of our uh, participants just sent us a note and said, uh, I agree so much with what you just said, Amber. Uh, this person is back in therapy with 40 years of being out. For me, it is a lifetime of unpacking. And I Absolutely. think that's exactly what you just said. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, Darren, Casey, y'all jump in on this. Sure. Um, I was... I, I love the intersections that Amber brought to this of both the gendered ways that purity culture affected her as a woman and the ways that this affects her as being gay. I would even add another intersection of as a person who is black, um, being in a society that's that's dominated by whiteness meant for me to to navigate being gay meant the double chance of being ostracized as well, if you're in a space that's gay affirming, it's probably not black versus mm -hmm. if you're in a space that's black and fully black affirming, it's probably not going to be very gay. And even the conversations um, that we've been having, so many of them have been mostly white. And so I can't even naturally bring the resources and the conversations that have been happening because they just don't always translate into um, into other cultures. And so it, it means always having to be on and choosing where you find safety and support and community. Um, but it also means things like PTSD and having uh, been traumatized over literal decades of my life to the point that I'm a 41 year old man today in weekly therapy, continuing to unpack things that happened 20 years ago. Um, and the, the financial cost of that, not choosing different things. You know, like I said, I was in school and gave up school. I don't have a degree. Most people don't even realize that um, because of this, yet I still have some, some uh, financial debt from going to school um, in a private school. Um, there are so many things that continue to show up, the broken ways that I relate to people, the kinds of church leaders that I, for years I kept finding myself drawn to narcissistic church leaders who 
would promise these great things and then blame me for the failures. And I felt, oh yeah, this is consistent. This is how I've heard, heard from the men of God for all these years. So there, there are just kind of a multitude of ways, insidious ways that it shows up over and over and over again. Earlier in my story, I mentioned being hopeless to the point of, of considering suicide. I mentioned the different family relationships and friendships that were broken, the financial um, impact of this, and just the ongoing ways that I know that when you, when you live with trauma, the trauma doesn't go away. You grow around it, you learn to deal with it, you have your coping mechanisms and your support networks, but it doesn't actually go away. And so I, you know, in some ways have felt cheated out of my college years and my young adult years. Um, but I, you know, I'm thankful for grace that I can still continue to build a new life, but it is, it is profound the cost and I have not counted them all yet. Yeah. Thanks, Jerry. Um, and I'll jump in kind of with a two part answer, one personal and one speaking to what I see in my professional life. Um, personally, the harms of that, the thing about distrusting the part of you that loves is that it isn't just about your sexual attraction or the gender to whom you're drawn. It, for me, it came into distrusting my relationship with my parents, distrusting the hobbies that I enjoyed, uh, sports, debate, distrusting uh, the professions I wanted to pursue as being too masculine uh, for a time. So you come to distrust all of these things and the patterns you pick up as you try to control the part of you that loves, as you try to stifle that part of you, that doesn't just apply to your relationships. I talked a little bit about the birth of a harm of self, a habit of self-harm. Um, that ultimately became a coping mechanism for all kinds of stressors in my life. So it wasn't just about girls at some point. It became the way I locked down and controlled everything. Um, to the extent that, you know, I've long since given that up and seen that as a harmful thing, but the instinct, the impulse to, if I feel a feeling too strongly, I distrust it. That's the sort of thing that continues on in your relationships well into adulthood and takes work to address. So that's something for even somebody who had, call it a graze with conversion therapy, uh, that can affect you. But also professionally. My organization, The Trevor Project, is the world's largest provider of suicide prevention and crisis intervention services to young queer people. And in the last year alone, our records show that over a thousand of the contacts who reached out to us have specifically called out conversion therapy in some way as part of why they're talking to us. Whether they've experienced it, are currently experiencing it, have been threatened with it by family if they were to come out, um, so this is a real and ongoing harm, and our research shows us that those youth who told us that they experienced conversion therapy, about 10% of a recent survey of more than 40,000 LGBTQ youth, um, those youth were twice as likely to have a suicide attempt in the past year than those youth who hadn't experienced conversion therapy, and they were more than two and a half times as likely to have multiple suicide attempts in the previous year. So there are so many harms that come out of conversion therapy, increased anxiety, depression, loss of faith, loss of community, broken relationships with family. But this is truly a life and death issue. Also, I just want to take a quick second and say, you know, maybe I should have said this at the start of the conversation. The stuff we're talking about is hard and it's triggering. And if you find yourself in a position where you need someone to talk to, you need some help, please reach out to the Trevor Project. We are here for you. And I would very like important to, to add one more thing that uh, the Casey's comment brought up for me. And I'm just going to, you know, again, be very transparent because I know I'm not the only one. Um, one of the one of the big messy side effects for this for me was sexual compulsion the shame and the guilt that was introduced to my sexuality through my church and through my church leaders and these efforts to change really produced some very unhealthy, very dangerous ways of exploring and connecting with sexuality that felt out of control, that felt beyond my own, my own abilities to, to, to make healthy and rational choices. And so many times in the, the stories we hear of people who were quote unquote changed, 
in the presentations we hear, we, we do hear people talk about sexual compulsion, but they make it as if, oh, this is the devil, or this was some maleficent force pushing me toward, quote unquote, the gay lifestyle. When in all actuality, when I had acceptance, when I had space to process these emotions, when I had space to be present with myself, that's what dealt with the uncontrolled desire and the, un and, and the unhealthy choices. It wasn't the thing that some people have mentioned places like Living Water, all these places that teach you this guilt and shame about your sexuality and about your sexual expression. It was very literally the grace to be present with myself that changed so much of that. And I, I mention it again because it's one of those things that feels separate or feels like, oh, well, that's, you know, other. But it, 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 for me, it was directly connected. And I, I think that we, we should have that as an important part of this conversation too. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a cool, would, yeah. Go yeah, ahead, I'll sorry, call it Casey. out that this, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy so often of they tell you that being gay will contribute to all of these destructive behaviors. And then the shame and guilt that is imposed contributes to those behaviors. And it turns into a self-fulfilling prophecy that then you start thinking maybe they're right when really that's the harm being done. And this is a great, con this, this conversation leads great into our next uh, segment that deals with uh, the connection between conversion therapy and faith. You know, one of the things that uh, we, we talked about or, or was revealed in our research uh, in the, the stories that were conducted, we interviewed Amy Butler uh, from Washington, D.C. And, and Amy talked about how the church historically has had this poor theology uh, dealing with sexuality in general. And we, we see this, this manipulative uh, theology of shame and guilt, also a theology of toxic masculinity. Uh, and conversion therapy is now expanding into a broader realm, uh, as I see it. I, I got word just this week that one of these organizations is now being invited into children's ministry to talk about proper gender roles, uh, to try to ward off having to, to, to have therapy later on down the road. Uh, do you think, and what, give us examples about this, this connection between bad theology and this harmful practice of conversion therapy? I'll, I wanna, wanna frame, frame a piece of this, and this kind of comes from one of the questions that uh, was been, has been submitted. Someone asked about um, if this is a side A or side B conversation. And to unpack that, um, I'm part of Q Christian Fellowship. Um, it's a national, even international network of Christians who are LGBTQ, their families, their friends, and so forth. Um, in that space, we have people who believe that as a gay person, one should abstain from um, same-sex sexual activity. Uh, but still identify as gay, and others who believe that one should pursue relationships and marriage and so forth as a gay person. Um, either one of those can healthfully hold the value that conversion therapy is unhealthy. And so sometimes people come to this conversation thinking that the only way to talk about, to, to leave conversion therapy or the idea that one can change their orientation is to go into full affirmation. And I want to just name that there's a lot of theological diversity and room for healthy conversations. And that to, have, to be here doesn't require a declaration of any of that other than that we are looking at what is the fruit of, um, of this ex-gay ideology. Um, everything else, there's actually still a lot of diversity. There's still a lot of thought. Um, but, but yeah, it's really important for us to to create the room for people to, to come to a lot of different conclusions, um, but to realize that some of what we say about, well, this is how men are supposed to be. This is how women are supposed to be. And then trying to force people to do that. I remember one of my pastors told me, well, don't come to me with that gay stuff. I need you to put some bass in your voice. I need you to to, uh, to make sure that, that you don't come around me with that, all, that soft talk and that kind of thing. He said this on the radio, like the kinds of ways that we enforce some of our harmful ideas about gender trickle into how we respond to people um, specifically around sexuality. Mm. Well said. 
Yeah, um, I definitely want to echo and reiterate the conversation about gender and how that underscores so much of what we see in the conversion therapy context. Um, even my own story speaks to, you know, having been described or feeling like the wrong kind of girl um, and how that plays into my orientation. But also today, just looking at the data and what conversion therapy is looking to, like today, we are seeing a sharp focus on gender identity change efforts and practices that are specifically targeting our young transgender and non-binary youth um, and attempting to change them. Um, gender has always been a core part of what conversion therapy looks like uh, whether it's the uh but i'm a cheerleader story of making somebody learn to play football uh, or if it is something more explicit to you know whether you are abiding by quote biblical manhood or biblical womanhood but today we are really seeing um kind of a rejuvenation of the conversion therapy industry in some sectors because of modern fear and misunderstanding of what gender identity is or means for um, today's youth and today's people. So that is something to keep a sharp eye out for. And now just in terms of things to be aware of, to know, oh, is this conversion therapy? Uh, if someone's talking to you about gender critical therapy, um, that is speaking the same way of let's see what these gender norms are and let's see if we can't force somebody to abide by them to change their underlying nature. So that's just a critical thing to be aware of. And yeah, the theology of this, any theology that does not lead to a person knowing love for themselves, their neighbor and their God, that's, that's bad for, and so I want to call out as a resource for folks in this conversation, a partner project between the Trevor Project and Q Christian Fellowship that we call the Good Fruit Project. You can find it at goodfruitproject.org that specifically calls out the harms of conversion therapy, what it looks like in faith communities, and makes a theological case, thanks to our friends over at Q Christian, um, for what is good and bad fruit. So check that out. Let me circle back to Mitch's original question and emphasize we had another question that came in that dovetails exactly with what Mitch was talking about. And that is the, what seems to be the intrinsic connection between conversion therapies and religious tenets uh, that also shows up in legislation. I mean, this person has said, uh, you know, it, it seems like all legislation related to this in religious exemptions and all bans on things and all the proponents of conversion therapy seem to have a religious basis for this. All the legal stuff seems to have a religious basis for it. Uh, is there any connection to this outside of the religious world? And maybe talk a little more, if you would, about that theological root to the whole thing. I mean, again, I'll say that there are lots of different ways to get to conversion therapy, lots of different ways to get to homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. Because um, I like to, as a Christian myself, I do like to remind folks, this isn't inherent to Christianity or inherent to religion, that it is homophobic, biphobic, or transphobic. Religion is often a fig leaf for bigotry and discrimination and fear. Mm. But you are correct that probably the majority of this is being spearheaded or um, energized by a religious energy. You do still see uh, some purely secular arguments for these change efforts, uh, twisted Freudian thought process, old school Jungian, whatever. Um, you see some arguments made on from evolution. So if somebody is biphobic, homophobic, or transphobic, they will find a way to root it in whatever their underlying philosophy mm. is. Uh, but yeah, too often the most respectable form of conversion therapy that I see out there is that that comes waving across. And I would jump in too and say that we're seeing a lot of um, kind of bait and switch where they'll say, oh, well, everybody's welcome in our church. Um, to try and get everybody in the doors, but then you realize once you're in there, you're not as safe as you thought. And in fact, I was on another panel last week that they said they had gone to some um, pride parade and even seen people um, out there saying free hugs with 
as if they were representing the Free Mom Hugs, which is a totally different organization doing great work. But behind it was a church that was non affirming that was trying to get people in the doors and try to get them to where they could be saved or fixed. And so a lot of it is that they're picking up on the lingo um, that we're using in more affirming communities and trying to use that to pull people in the doors. And so we, I really always recommend things like church clarity, um, where people can go on and find an affirming church in their area that has been rated and scored, um, or to even look up a church that they're curious about to, in their area that they're maybe thinking about attending to find out uh, where that church stands before they walk in the door so that they know going in because LGBT people have already had so much religious trauma they don't need to be traumatized anymore. And so they need to have the tools to be able to know before they walk in the door where they really stand um, rather than going and thinking that they're safe only to be traumatized even further. Yeah, and as we're talking about this, this both and we're, we're talking about, like I was uh, recently, uh, the film Pray Away was released on Netflix and it talks in depth about uh, some of the leaders of this movement. And it was so interesting to me that um, I spend time in a lot of places. And so one of the spaces that I'm in is this pretty much atheist or at least agnostic black folks. And to hear them still echoing the very talking points that were crafted and publicized by the leaders of Exodus in the eighties as they rose, as, as they paired with conservative hard right folks to rise into to political power, to hear those same talking points still being echoed. Um, there's a rapper right now who made a big stink about Little Nas X, and he's still talking about, but what about the children? We're trying to raise our children right. And responding that Little Nas X existing in him as he is, as a rapper on the same plane as this, uh, as this heterosexual rapper, um, that somehow that was a problem for children, even though this rapper raps about, you know, misogynistic ways of treating women and selling drugs and shooting people with guns. Like, the dissonance is absolutely amazing, but the reach of this kind of ideology, the reach of this, you know, things like, oh, well, we have to protect the children. That, that's a religious idea that is just translated out into all kinds of spaces, even in the, the conversations we're seeing today. Yeah, and we're not just seeing a co-opting of religious language, we're seeing a co-opting of civil rights language. Uh, the film in Pray Away, you saw an organizer of what he called a freedom march. Um, that was actually promoting ex-gay and ex-trans philosophies. Um, you're seeing a co-opting of academic language about sexual fluidity and the fluidity of orientation. So taking ideas about how some people do experience changes in their sexuality over time and then twisting that to suggest that because some people do, anybody can or should. And so you're seeing these important ideas, even phrases like coming out and love is love being adopted and hijacked really for the same old snake oil, just with different packaging. I think this is an excellent point because in our research uh, leading up to our, our five stories, um, we, were, uh, we were told time and time again by people who we believe practice conversion therapy that they were not practicing conversion therapy. Uh, and they, it goes by another, uh, other names now, as we, we talked about earlier in the segment. Um, it seems as though in some of these instances that they know that this practice fails across the board. Because in one of our interviews, our interviewee said, there comes a time where you work through the curriculum and you work through the program and you're done. And you're still gay. <laughs> and, and, and it's like there's almost an admission now by some of these groups uh, that they cannot change a person's sexual orientation. But now it seems as though they're changing their tactics. What are some of the, the more recent tactics and strategies that you, you have heard of? I mean, you run into the changing of the definition of victory, changing the definition of success. Uh, Darren talked about it early of how, you know, uh, desires did not change, but behaviors could. And yeah, of course, anybody can like have a different set of behaviors for a time or for a longer period of time. Um, but that does not change intrinsically who you are. But so they will now, especially because some of them are being held legally liable, 
um, as was in the case of an organization called Jonah. Um, Jews offering new alternatives to homosexuality is what that spelled out to. Uh, they were actually um, convicted for fraud and held civilly liable to the tune of millions of dollars because they made the promise of, quote, people can change. And no, people didn't. And there was no factual or evidence-based basis to make that claim. So now that you're seeing that kind of legal liability being out there, uh, the promoters of these practices are getting uh, mushier, more weasel words in what they're promising. But everybody does ultimately know what they're really promising. You talk to the folks who keep going to this and they, they hope for heterosexuality, whether or not they're explicitly being promised it in black and white in a contract anymore. And that's still where the hurt is coming from because they're hearing that same promise, whether it's being made explicitly or not. I, I love the, the way you nuanced how words are being, being co-opted and semantics comes into play. Um, for example, in church, I've heard people argue, well, your, your identity is supposed to be in Christ. And they're using identity in a way that they're kind of lifting some of what's in the biblical language and then applying it in these very modern ways that are also inconsistent with their own lives because no one's fighting about, well, I'm a husband and a Christ follower. No one's saying you can't call yourself a husband. <laughs> but as soon as I introduce or describe is what I say when I share what my, uh, what my, that I'm gay, I'm describing a part of my life but that's being weaponized into, no, 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 you're not supposed to identify as anything but a Christian. And it sounds good, right? It sounds like, yes, this is the faithful answer, but it's not consistent, it's not accurate. Or I've been, when I see people um, talk about uh, the super straight movement or the straight pride movement, um, people who are unaware of why pride exists will say, well, everybody should be able to have pride, right? So of course there should be straight pride not realizing that 100% maybe, I don't, I haven't checked every single one, but not realizing that the most visible, researchable founders of straight pride parades and straight, um, super straight movements are hard, right, fast, fascist, like people who have been actively engaged in nationalism, people who have been engaged in racism, people who have been overtly political in their desires to see certain outcomes. And so they've, they've notably um, taken on this, these tactics of using people's ignorance plus the desire to belong to say, well, everyone should be able to have pride, right? Not realizing that they are basically kind of co-opting people into supporting something and not realizing exactly what it is they're co-opting. So when people say, well, anybody, well, if the gay people can have a pride parade, why can't I? And then they'll get someone else to go, yeah, that makes sense. It's about fairness. It's about equality. Not realizing they're actively supporting someone who is fighting for the very opposite of equality or equity even. Um, they're fighting for oppression and doing it in the name of, well, as a straight person, I have a right to believe what I want to believe. And, and they believe that their straightness should be able to silence, limit, and invalidate my civil rights as a person who's queer. Yeah. I mean, another one of the twists that we often hear, and it kind of goes back to the question about what theologies are causing some pain, um, is the, now they're promising, it's not about heterosexuality, it's about holiness. Uh, they've got a lot of these cute phrases that they're good with. Uh, again, yeah, holiness sounds wonderful. I go to church, I want to be holy that way. But when you pair that in with a theology that puts, you know, husband, wife, baby on such a pedestal of, you know, if you want to be holy, then you will get married straightly and, you know, have children. And that is what the, what the evangelical dream looks like, um, then it is very clear what is being promoted. And so this is something that even speaks to um, our LGBT friends who are committed to a traditionalist theology or um, committed to celibacy. Uh, we're all harmed when one way of having a family is privileged so incredibly highly and made into a substitute for holiness, dare I say, made into an idol.
So th mm. that is a that is a great segue into a question one of our panel uh, one of our participants has asked uh, right along the same line, and it's where does a Christ follower go who believes in the key tenets of biblical teaching but is gay? For example, this person says, "I believe in the covenant of marriage, but believe it's open to same-sex couples." Uh, I've been married to a woman for 20 years and I want to save that covenant relationship with a woman. Uh, uh, so I, I think this is a common question. I know I've, I've heard this a lot from people who've written to me uh, asking, where can I find some traditional uh, Christian affirmation, but also affirmation uh, of the LGBTQ identity or community? Are you asking in terms of research, like resources, like book resources, Mark? I think anything, right? Because I, I, some of the resources that I most often recommend are like David Gushy. His Changing Our Mind is a great place to start for people that are trying to kind of look at things from a theological and historical perspective, um, but still kind of have that, that biblical basis. Um, I think David Gushy does a wonderful job of that. And I recommend his book is probably one of the top. Um, I also really recommend Unclobber by Colby Martin as yep. a great place to kind of look at specifically what the Bible says about um, same-sex relationships and to help kind of deconstruct some of the old and bad theology that we've been taught around that and give it a fresh perspective. Yeah, I would, yeah. For, I would jump in and say, uh, as, as an observer and commentator on all of this, uh, I mean, David Gushy is one of our columnists. He's, he's, it, he wrote that book originally as a series of columns for uh, Baptist News Global, uh, and then it became this, this best-selling book. Uh, the Q Christian Fellowship, uh, the Reformation Project, uh, the Trevor Project, all have tremendous resources mm -hmm. that lead people not away from faith, uh, but into faith. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important thing uh, to note. And I'll give a shameless promotion for my own book, uh, which is called Why Churches Need to Talk About Sexuality, that tells our church's story of working through this process while purposely wanting to remain biblically centered in this, and there is a way to do that. Yeah. Yeah, the nice thing to know is, and I'll call out the resources page at the back of the Good Fruit Project as uh, my favorite list, but we are living in kind of a golden age for increasing numbers of different churches coming from different traditions and backgrounds that embrace their own tradition, but also embrace their LGBTQ members for who they are. So, I mean, it is hard to say because I know how hard that hunt is to find a church that meets you in both of those places, but there are more places that you can find today that will meet you there. So the, the hunt is worth making. Well, and I would say that our resources that have come out over the last 10 years has grown substantially. So we're not having to do as much digging as when, you know, I was coming out 10 years ago and could barely find anything. There are so many resources available now um, between the Reformation Project and Q Christian and Trevor Project and um, so many affirming allies and LGBTQ people that are writing their own books and their own memoirs. And uh, we've got a great strong list of, resources now that were not available just even a few years ago. Yeah, and for anyone who's watching and maybe doesn't have access to the chat or anything, this is goodfruitproject.com slash resources. And there are clickable links to all kinds of things, everything from theology to organizations, um, data research, uh, lots and lots of book references. There's a lot out there. And I'm so thankful for how much has grown and it's continuing mm -hmm. to grow. There's books that are on the horizon out for next month. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but yeah, the, the thing I think also to rem remember is that you're not alone. There are parent groups, there are Facebook groups where mm -hmm. people are talking about this. There are people uh, uh, like PFLAG that exist all over the country where people are just trying to show up and have these conversations. Yeah. yeah. And the last thing I'll put out there is as much as we've had this explosion of new materials, we need to hear more stories. Uh, we need to hear more stories from communities of color, from folks of minority faiths and denominations in the U.S., mm -hmm. um, international perspectives. Mm -hmm. um, folks come to me all the time asking for, have you seen a book about XYZ thing? And I am always collecting these resources. 
to date, a lot of the story that's been told has been a certain kind of white, a certain kind of Protestant. Um, but I'm looking for that Mormon of color telling their story. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a story to tell, think about telling it. We could hear mm -hmm. it. I want to go back uh, as we're possibly bringing this to a close. I want to go back to something that Darren said a moment ago in this understanding that uh, the conversation that we're having today uh, dealing with LGBTQ plus individuals, this conversation about conversion therapy can be made uh, or needs to take place in the realm of concentrating on the harm this practice inflicts upon people. Uh, you can be uh, someone who holds a different theological position from me, someone who reads the Bible in a more traditional way. We can have that conversation. The conversation that needs that this needs to stay focused on is the harm that this practice causes on people. What is being done in the name of conversion therapy, what is being done in any form of conversion therapy is bringing people to self-harm, to the brink of suicide, suicide attempts, and I am so saddened to say the very active suicide. This conversation needs to take place. This practice of conversion therapy in any form needs to cease. Now across the country, there are laws being passed that are banning conversion therapy. But as we know, this ban does not extend to faith-based organization and churches. So what are these bans doing and what are they not doing? And for what they're not doing, what can people of good faith do to bring uh, this practice to an end? I think that sounds probably like my call. Uh... In 20 states and nearly 100 cities and counties across the country today, uh, laws have been passed that prohibit the practice of conversion therapy, any of these change efforts, uh, by licensed professionals on minors. Uh, that is not an insignificant portion of the conversion therapy that we see happening out there, but it is not the majority of it either. Uh, Part of the benefit of these laws is that they do do a lot of work to educate people about conversion therapy, what it is and its harms, as we have these conversations, as we get media coverage every time it's passed. And also, every time we pass uh, one of these laws governing licensed professionals, it always amazes me to see the unlicensed religious ministers and religious practitioners who come out of the woodwork to say that these laws will make their lives more difficult because it explains to their potential client base and customers just how harmful this is. In some ways, it's kind of like slapping a warning label on cigarettes. You make it illegal for minors to purchase them and hopefully adults get the idea that it's not healthy for anybody. So, but that's what's happening, but it does leave a lot of work to be done in these spaces for these faith-based ministries and these practices that are um, focusing in on somebody who is 18, 19, 20 and older, uh, which is a lot of conversion therapy happening today. So the laws are doing good work to educate. I like to say the law is a teacher, but they can't do everything. And the most important work on this, I think is gonna happen in hearts and minds around dinner tables. And honestly, in the pews from the pulpit and in the church office, as you sit down and say, what happens? when a kid comes out as gay in our youth group? Uh, what happens when somebody goes to the uh, biblical counselor who we employ at our mega church and they talk about their concerns about their gender identity? And who do they get referred to? Who do they get connected to? So those are the conversations that need to happen. And these are the things that we need to see in our faith communities so that we can stop this practice from happening and this harm from occurring. Exactly. Um, and I think it's worth noting, um, we, we've, we've hinted at the political nature of this, that these efforts are bipartisan for us to end conversion therapy. Illinois, uh, when we signed our bill, and I think it was 2015, um, our Republican governor signed, signed that bill to ban the practice in Illinois. 
um, again, sometimes we can get lost in, in some of the, the, the partisan battles back and forth, but everyone, I, I say everyone has a role in making the world a better place for everyone in it. And so just like Casey mentioned, um, the different ways that we can prompt our churches to have these conversations so many times, and I was a part of a church that was like this, I mentioned in my story, in the effort or the desire to not rock the boat or to not cause trouble or to not cause harm, churches don't have clear policy and don't have written um, accessible um, ways for the people who are part of that community to know what does our church believe. And as Amber mentioned, if you're trying to figure that out, you can click on church clarity, find a church that, that believes what you believe and see what they publicly have written to help understand and to help um, people navigate what what's believed in that community. Um, so it's not something that you have to do alone, but you have to do the work. And if no one has done it in your work, in your community, then I, I would prompt you to be the be the squeaky wheel, be the one who meets with the pastor, be the one who meets with the elders, be the one who is his who's asking the youth group leader the same those same questions. Um, and you may, I've, I've often heard pastors say, well, we don't have anybody who's queer in our church. So this isn't a conversation for us. <laughs> and what that actually is saying to me is that our church is not a place that's safe enough for someone to identify. Um, even on a stronger front, if none of the parents in your church are talking about this, then they don't trust your church. I, I'll, I'll say that just bl bluntly that way, that this is typically some of the first people who are needing to have these conversations are the parents of LGBTQ kids, but because your church community has not made it safe for them to bring that their kid is struggling or having a question, they're not going to bring it there. They're going to find some help somewhere else. And if, and I think that the church should be a safe community, but we have to put in a lot of work. It will be messy, but in the end, we can make, make our churches and our community safer for, for LGBTQ people and their families and, and friends. Uh, and I would say just to piggyback on that, you know, just because they don't know that they're not there doesn't mean that they're not there. They're there. They have LGBTQ people in their pews, whether they know it or not. But like you said, Darren, they just aren't feeling safe enough to identify themselves and be out. And for those who are not in the church, but as a lay person, um, you know, if you're not in church leadership, but just as a person, like share your stories um, share, share your coming out stories or share your stories of becoming affirming, becoming an ally. Um, you know, the Pray Away documentary right now is very prominent and sparking a lot of conversation. Um, watch the documentary, share that documentary, talk about it on social media. These are all ways that we can help raise awareness about conversion therapy and the harm that it's doing nationwide. Uh, you don't have to be a church leader to do that. Re you know, all of us have a part that we can play in helping end the harms that conversion therapy is doing. Well, this is a great point for us to wrap up our conversation as our time is expiring here. And I would just uh, uh, offer this comment in some of this last bit of the conversation. And that is, uh, if you are a pastor or if you're a lay leader uh, or just a member of a congregation, you can make a difference in educating your con congregation about these important issues. Uh, we wanna call your attention again to the excellent resource that the Trevor Project and Q Christian Fellowship have put out together. Uh, the link has been posted there. We've talked about it several times. Uh, I highly encourage you to, to follow that. Go to Good Faith Media, uh, look up the, the video stories that they've posted today. Come to our site at baptistnews.com and look at the array of uh, opinion and news stories that we have uh, published about these issues as well. Uh, and they're all there. One of the churches that's most prominent in the Pray Away documentary is located very near to where I live in Texas. And I know a lot of people who are members of that church who would tell you to this day, this is not what's happening at my church because it's been renamed as something else. And yet I hear from Baylor University students and other individuals who are still being hauled up uh, to this church uh, to be therapized in this way who are being harmed by this. And so awareness and lay leadership can indeed make a difference. I want to thank our panelists, thank Mitch, uh, thank uh, all of you who've made this possible. It's been a wonderful conversation. And uh, thank you all who've joined us. 
Only a few of you dropped out along the way. So uh, we had a great retention rate. Thanks a bunch to everyone and y'all have a great afternoon. Support independent faith-based journalism. Baptist News Global.